Howdy folks, I'm Hank Sheffer, and welcome to another true life story right here with Larry Hedrick on Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains. In the uh, late 1860s, there was a gentleman by the name of Jack Swilling who was living in the Phoenix area, which was really nothing more than a hay camp at that time, growing alfalfa and stuff for the horses out of Fort McDowell. Jack became known as the father of irrigation in the Valley of the Sun. He actually wasn't the father of irrigation because it was the Hohokam Indians that dug all the canals out there. And I have a very fine uh, artifact of a Hohokam hoe that I call it, but it could well be a shovel because it was handheld, sharpened on the edge. And this is what the Indians used to dig these canals that's all over the, the valley. There must have been tens of thousands of them out there uh, doing this because it was a Herculean effort. Uh, Swilling opened up all those canals and using Salt River water was uh, providing irrigation to all the farmers and ranchers in, in the area. Well, for decades there was talk about reservoirs and dams and things of that nature, but it never came to fruition until about uh, 1898, uh, President Theodore Roosevelt was supporting a bill in Congress about ir irrigation, and when it passed, he finally signed it into leg legislation. And this is why Roosevelt Dam was named after Teddy Roosevelt. Roosevelt Dam is the world's largest masonry dam. It was then, and it still is today, the largest masonry dam in the world. Uh, Italian stonemasons were brought in from the East Coast. There were all kinds of various labors that were brought in, carpenters and what have you. And as many as 3,000 people worked on this project. Anyway, one of the first things that had to be done was a building of a wagon road to get to the dam from Mesa, where the spur was of the railroad, uh, bringing supplies up to the, to the dam so it could be built. Uh, this started in 1903 and the road was finished by 1905. And at the height of the dam construction, which was dedicated in 1911, they claimed that two and a half million pounds a month of materials was traveling up the uh, Apache Trail. And as many as 20 to 60 wagons were on the trail every day. Uh, I might bring in here that you might want to go look up the story of Hacksaw Tom, because this guy was evidently pretty busy. However, he was not in the picture after 1906. I think there's just too much traffic to, uh, and too much effort to catch him, and he disappeared from the scene. But that's a good story you might want to look up on mysteries. So in March of 1911, Teddy Roosevelt in a 25-car cavalcade left Phoenix and headed for uh, the Roosevelt Dam along the Salt, the Salt River and the old wagon road that we know today as Apache Trail. That particular year had been pretty wet in the wintertime and he remarked about the beauty of all the wildfires as they went along the way. Many of us have found the various years where the poppies just covered the slopes of Superstition Mountain and the wildflowers all along the road. But you got to remember today, Apache Trail doesn't follow the exact route that the old wagon road did. Uh, there was, when Roosevelt was here, there wasn't any Apache Lake. There wasn't any Canyon Lake. None of the dams below Roosevelt had been constructed yet. And the road run right through Apache Lake and is now buried under water. And our road today, half of it's paved. And some of the worst places along Apache Trail were wagons couldn't pass each other. If you, if you met a wagon coming down while you were going up with 12 mules on a team, what do you do? <laughs> it, it's a whole other animal today. But they finally got to uh, Tortilla Flat, which is uh, tens of thousands of people have visited Tortilla Flat, including many historical figures like Gary Cooper and, and John Wayne and Clark Gable. James Sturt and Harry Morgan, all these people made pictures up there in that area and uh, they stopped for a short time before proceeding. And on, on they went to, uh, finally got to Fish Creek Hill. Uh, Fish Creek Hill was a little narrower than it is today, steeper than it is today. 
and there were no guardrails. Uh, Roosevelt was indeed impressed with Arizona at, the, at that point. There's nothing I can say that's any more beautiful in the superstition area than to be at the bridge at the bottom of Fish Creek Hill. It's 2,000 feet straight up on one side, and when you're up at the top coming down, it's 1,000 foot straight down. In fact, within a mile, you drop 900 feet. Anyway, uh, when he rounded the bend, and the, uh, the people at the dam could see him, an 11-gun salute was fired. And Teddy Roosevelt had a few nice things to say about Arizona. He says, I want you to recollect the men who built the dam, who made that road to Roosevelt Dam. I hope people will realize, which I am bound to say I did not, nor or never realized until this moment, what an extraordinary, beautiful, and picturesque strip of country this is. I think that the drive from the beautiful city of Phoenix, especially the few miles down that extraordinary gorge, then to see this lake and dam, I think is one of the most spectacular, best worth seeing places in the world. And I hope our people will realize I want them to see and come tens of thousands, just as they do at Yosemite or the Grand Canyon or Yellowstone Park. Teddy Roosevelt fell in love with Arizona. He fell in love with that dam where every thousand pound block could be seen individually as they stair-stepped up to 280 feet. He was really impressed with everything. After the dam was finished, um, it, which I can say was a Herculean effort, some flooding had taken place that was similar to the 100-year flood we had in 1891. And there were two or three floods that caused the dam to overflow. And they weren't so concerned about losing Roosevelt Dam itself, but the dams below the the uh, Roosevelt Dam that had been built in the meantime were not structured to take overflow. So they were concerned about saving these other four dams and they decided to raise the height of Roosevelt Dam 77 feet. In order to do that, they had to take off several feet off the top because you, had, you were able to drive across the dam in those days. And and they had guard towers and parapets and things like that that all had to be torn down. And the, the rock that they took off was taken back to the very quarry where it was quarried in the first place, which was a couple of miles uh, further north from the dam. And the stonemasons would work all day at the quarry making, the, making these big rock. And they'd be transported by wagon down to where they had a, a cable stretched across the uh, canyon. And they'd be at night. They'd be lowered down in the canyon uh, for, for to be used the next day. Anyway, Tom Collinborn came to me at the museum in the early '90s, and uh, he was very excited that he had talked to the Bureau of Reclamation, and a deal was being worked that um, a permanent loan would be made to the museum of some of these these rocks off of the dam. Now that got me excited. Uh, this was a very historic thing, and uh, nobody else had any of them. And I, 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 I wanted to get involved in that real quick. But we were located at Goldfield Ghost Town at the time in a rented facility. The museum didn't really have any money or anything like that. So um, I bought a 1969 Ford cab over flatbed truck. Uh, it had brand new tires on it. It had a two-speed rear axle. It had a 1988 brand new engine in it. And uh, we went down to Empire Machinery where Tom knew a fellow that uh, was kind of high up in the, there. And we made a deal with them to buy a used crane, a 6,000 pound capacity crane and a set of outriggers. And uh, we bought that and brought it out here to my place. And Hank Brown and I and my oldest son, Christopher, built that truck right here on this property. So the time came to make our first run up there, and we didn't take the big the truck at the f first run. We met with them. They showed us where the uh, quarry was, and uh, it was just amazing. 
All the rock had been hauled up there by dump trucks and just dumped in piles and broke them all up and stuff like that. But there were quite a few of them that were in, in, totally intact. And um, that's what we was really after. So after we knew where they were and had permission, and I asked the guy, I said, how much do you think one of these blocks would weigh? Well, the average block is about five feet long and 18 inches square and he thought they'd weigh about 800 pounds. So we brought the truck up, just, just Hank and I, and I, I, I drove separately in, in, in another S10 pickup. We had walkie-talkies and stuff like that in case anything went wrong. And uh, the first rock that I saw was the biggest one in the pile. It was seven feet long, and it just barely could get it. The crane was straight out, which meant it didn't have much that much lifting power, but it picked it up like it wasn't even there. We loaded it behind the cab on the truck and we picked up several others and put them on the truck. And getting out of Roosevelt, uh, where the lake was, was a long climb going to Globe. Well, that's the way we came in, through Superior, Miami, and up to, the, to, to Roosevelt Lake and past Roosevelt Lake towards Pumpkin Center to where this quarry was. And it was a tremendously long climb getting out of there. And I didn't want to go on Beeline Highway at all because there were several very steep climbs that, uh, on Beeline Highway. So smart me, I thought, well, you know, everything come up Apache Trail, why don't we go back on Apache Trail? Because as far as I was concerned, there was only one place you had to be concerned about, and that was Fish Creek Hill, a 10% grade for almost a mile. We didn't have any trouble getting there. It was slow going, of course. We got to the bridge and there was a sharp turn to get onto the bridge and a sharp turn to get off. And just unfortunately, as we were trying to get off, a car came down the, the road. And this was a, just virtually a one lane highway, a dirt road. And we had to come to a stop. Well, the truck had an automatic transmission. And once you lost your speed, with all that weight on there, we couldn't get going up the hill. So we backed across the bridge and we offloaded three blocks. And since I was in the pickup and we had to have hard hats while we were on the job, so I had a build hard hat that had a, an Air Force emblem on it that was uh, pretty noticeable. And I drove up to the top with the S10 and uh, put that hard hat on and I stopped traffic like I was somebody. <laughs> I had five cars backed up, but unfortunately one car got by me before I got to the top. I radioed Hank that this car was coming and, and he, he could come up when the, when the car crossed the bridge. So um, I explained to each car what was going on and they were, uh, you know, they were very generous to, to wait that long. But finally, Hank radioed that he was coming, and you could hear that truck screaming all the way up, the, the sound bouncing off the canyon walls and stuff. And, <clears throat> and when he got up to where I was, he didn't even stop. He just kept going. He wasn't about to slow down because it was an 8% grade for another mile. And finally, we got out of there <clears throat> and offloaded the, um, the rocks down at the... Um, new museum site that didn't have anything on it. But we left that one big one on there. We wanted to know how much that weighed. So we went down the Apache Junction water and we knew there was a scale and weighed that truck. That seven foot boulder weighed 3,500 pounds. <laughs> and if I'd have been caught, I'd have still been paying fines on, on that overload. We were so overloaded. So Hank and I went immediately back up to get the other three rock that we'd left at Fish Creek Bridge, and they were gone. We were flabbergasted. We had no idea how anybody could take those rocks. We had to have a crane to get them off, uh, get them on and get them off, and they were gone. Now, we finally got them back, and I'm not going to tell you how. I'm not going there. Can't touch that but we finally got them back. And how they done that was just another mystery of the Superstition Mountains. Now my whole plan for going up and getting these was um, wanting to make an amphitheater out of them. 
And we have lectures at the museum uh, at certain times of the year, once a week, and people sit on this, these rocks. And by the time we finished up and, um, and made a monument with our logo on top of it for the museum, we had about 60 of these, these complete rocks. In fact, I think we got every one of them that wasn't busted and got them out of there. Um, but after that incident at Fish Creek Hill, it was obvious this was gonna take much longer than we thought and get pretty expensive because we were gonna to have to make much smaller loads and uh, figure some things out. Um, but um, Tom got a hold of Salt River Project and after a few loads, Salt River Project going up there with a huge flatbed truck and a huge crane and we made one last load and uh, brought the whole thing home and that, that finished the project. I'd like to finish up just by saying one thing that I'd forgot to mention. Um, around 1915, water was captured off the overflow at the dam and was used to christen the USS Arizona. And I wanna say that I'm proud that I had a little part in Roosevelt Dam and my, I've got a real soft spot in my heart for it, too. Thank you for watching this episode of Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains.